Are you proud to be Hispanic? Hispanics in Florida now have the first Hispanic car license plate in the United States. Be a proud Hispanic. Put the Hispanic plate on your car. I want to be a doctor. I want to be a scientist. I want to be an engineer. I want to be a police officer. I want to be a professional dancer. By getting the Hispanic plate for your car, you will support scholarships and community programs. The Hispanic plate is available at any Department of Motor Vehicle office. Call now at 321-277-0850 or visit hispanicachievers.org. On April 26, the Legal Aid Society of the Orange County Bar Association, in association with the American Immigration Lawyers Association, will be hosting Citizenship Day. During this one-day free clinic, legal permanent residents will be able to apply for citizenship with the help of volunteers and as well with the help of immigration attorneys who will review the application. Please call 407-841-8310, extension 3123 for an appointment. Hi, I'm Danny Ramos and welcome to this week's edition of Hispanic Speak Out TV brought to you on Bright House Cable for the past 14 years. Uh, what we do here is we cover issues that are pertinent to the Hispanic community and Central Florida as a whole. We have a very interesting interview coming here tonight. I have with me Maria Padilla. I don't think there's anybody in Central Florida who doesn't know Maria Padilla as one of the top <laughs> journalists in print uh, in all of Orlando, uh, the five county area. She was a uh, editor-in-chief, and now she has um, doing a blog called Orlando Latino, where she just lays it all out. And if you want to know about the Hispanic community on an ongoing basis every day, you go to Orlando Latino blog, and that's uh, Maria Padilla. Uh, we're here also with Lou Oliver, and he's the Orange County Chair for the Republican Party. There has been much controversy uh, in the last week regarding uh, Mr. Oliver's comments and the involvement of his comments with the Puerto Rican community. So I'm going to, we're going to start off right off. Uh, Maria, why don't you take the first uh, question? Thank you, Danny, by the way, and thank you, Maria. Why did you shoot off the email that you did to the reporter of the Orlando Sentinel, Scott Powers, instead of, was there an attempt to make a call and get in contact with you? No, it, you know, honestly, I've been in the political process for 15, 16, 20 years plus. Um, I know better. I, you know, um, it was a busy Monday morning, as, as, as you may know or may not know. The chairman of the Republican Party, like the chairman of the Democrat Party, is a volunteer position. You know, yes. we don't get paid. Well, I have a job. I have to run a business. I have right. many employees, most of whom, by the way, are Puerto Rican. Um, and it was a, you know, a quick email, which I responded to in like literally five minutes. If you talk with Scott, he'll confirm that he sent me an email at like 1020. I think I replied at 1025 or something. Um, I didn't think much about it at the time. Uh, I was in the middle of a bunch of other things. And, you know, it's one of the top lessons in politics that you should think about anything you put in writing. You should, um, you know, let it sink in overnight. You should analyze it from the perspective of how could somebody misinterpret it. What, what and was if I'd it, done all of those things, I wouldn't have sent that email. What was it exactly, the words, what was the statement that caused this uproar? Because a lot of people, some people don't know what happened. Right. Well, what, what I did was the, the actual question was about voter registration numbers. And right. in responding to voter registration numbers, I pointed out that Democrats are doing much better than Republicans here in Orange County. And that most of that is because of the demographic change, that we have far more Hispanic um, citizens today, and they tend to register Democrat. And, and I was expressing the fact that that was frustrating for me because it's been my experience in the community that the huge majority of folks that move here, particularly Puerto Ricans, whether they've come from Puerto Rico or New York or Philadelphia or Chicago or, uh, or, or Detroit um, or New Jersey, are coming for, for better economic opportunities because they can get a better education for their kids, because there are better jobs, because they see a better future. Um, some come because they have family and some like the, the sunny climate, but mostly it's opportunity. And the frustration that many of us have in, in the Republican community is that I personally understand the frustration with the, with the Republican Party on issues like immigration. I understand the problems with statehood, and I disagree with my own party on that subject. But the frustrating part is that so many people, the core of their lives, are about the futures of their families. They're about these economic decisions. And what they don't seem to realize, I think, and the part that frustrated me and that caused me to make my statements out of frustration, were that if they look at what all of these places that they came from had in common, there's a common denominator. The educations are not good. The job opportunities are not good. The prospects for a future are not good. 
and all of them are run by Democrats. But it was beyond that. That was the point. It was beyond that, Lou, because it was the tone of the email that seemed to be disparaging to Hispanics, and we all caught it. Uh, not just Hispanics, but to the Puerto Rican community uh, overall. And in addition to that, there were things in your comments that were factually wrong. Well, they were factually wrong. <coughs> For instance, if we go back to the original question as to why mm -hmm. uh, Latinos or Hispanics are registering more as uh, you're not registering as Republicans, which I think was the original question. Sure. Um, it's also true that a great proportion of Latinos are registering in no party affiliation. It's not just that they're going Democrat, it's also no party affiliation. True. There was hardly any mention of that. And then when you mention and when you throw in all the cities or the states, it's a, there's a lot of uh, uh, complex history there as to who was in power, who's not in power, whether it's a Republican, whether it's a Democrat, why people move, why they don't move. Sure. And in particular, when you start talking about Puerto Rico, Mm -hmm. whose relationship with the United States is so sensitive. difficult, yes. sensitive, and right. complex, and frankly, very few people understand it. Right. Uh, when you throw all that in the mix, I mean, there was bound to be some sort of combustion. Well, Maria, I think you're right. Um, I recognize that. Um, one of the things, I've, I've apologized for it publicly, in writing, in detail. And I have um, to congratulate you for that, because it did seem to be a heartfelt apology. It, it was. Um, you know, not only did I do myself damage, which is... The part of the part of the game, but I also damaged my party. I yes, damaged my friends inside of the Republican Party, particularly Puerto Rican friends, and I did it on the basis of three minutes worth of time punching out a fast email. And so, uh, my hope is that people understand the apology. That uh, I didn't attempt to equivocate, explain myself. I didn't attack the messenger. I didn't say, "Hey, look, the Democratic Party is out to get me." Um, you know, I think adults have to take their lumps. When you make a mistake, you stand up, you own up to it, you what, apologize. What was it specifically that what you I said? Specifically said? What was it? What I specifically said after giving this list of these places where, where Puerto Ricans have moved here from, New York, you know, New Jersey, and the rest of it, and including Puerto Rico, I went on to say that in Puerto Rico, if, if you're the, the highest aspiration for people in Puerto Rico was to, to a cushy government job, and that Puerto um, Rico was a basket case. And that case. Puerto Rico was a basket case. And what I, what I meant literally by that and what was interpreted, now I didn't say this, and, and the implication has been that I, that I intended this, was that the reason people aspire to government jobs in Puerto Rico is because that's what they'd rather have because they're lazy and that's the easy way out. And but nobody what wants you to work. said was not even but, correct because but, half the what, workers in Puerto Rico do not work for the government. That number is under one-third well, and declining. But, but my point is that... My point is that for people who are looking for great opportunities there, they have very few other choices. The best jobs in Puerto Rico, by and large, are government jobs because industry isn't creating jobs in Puerto Rico. Entrepreneurs are not creating jobs in Puerto Rico. There are no high-tech companies in Puerto Rico. The yes, pharmaceutical, there are. very few. The pharmaceutical companies that were there were there because there were economic tax incentives and, and right. basis. And when those tax incentives ran out, so too did the companies leave. Right. And as a result, there are very few opportunities, which is why people, and my, my major point, uh, which I stick by, is that very large numbers of Puerto Ricans around our country, Puerto Rico, New York, and elsewhere, have already voted against democratic policy, policies and for Republican policies with their feet. But that's by not moving you, themselves because their family. people always vote with their feet. No matter Absolutely. where they're going, people always vote with their feet. Beyond but question. I tell you what the issue was with your, with what you, with mm -hmm. that quick uh, email that you shot off to the Orlando Sentinel. It was the tone. The tone was completely um, unforgivable, and in many ways, it's just we were all just sort of flabbergasted. Where did that come from? And so, when you think about stupidity, well, but when you think about, uh, you said it. Yes. When you think about why doesn't or why can't the Republican Party attract not just Latino, right. but African American and maybe even women, because you have a problem with women as well. That's three major groups you're talking about now. Mm -hmm. It's your tone. Right. It's your tone. You can't talk to people that way. You can't talk about people that way. I, There's I, a I, lack I, of respect. Are you saying that that's the general tone of the Republican Party towards women? It seems to be that way. There were a couple of other incidents not involving you earlier uh, in March uh, regarding Governor Scott's uh, campaign when his chief uh, financial campaign guy, I think, resigned over a comment 
Now, there may be a lot of other inside things, which he said some people which were, were um, sort of mocking Mexican accents, and he was sure. not going to abide that. Well, where does that come from? Right. You know, who, who, in whose mind is that acceptable? Well, one, one apology at a time. Uh, I'll, take, <laughs> I'll take my lumps for my own, for my own actions. I, I believe that as an honorable person, you have to. Um, I also believe, that if I may disagree with you gently, and that is that we live in a culture in America, hopefully, where as long as you can demonstrate sincerity, nothing is unforgivable. I didn't intentionally damage anybody. Most of my staff is Puerto Rican. Many of my clients are Puerto Rican. As almost all of the elected officials know in Central Florida, I have been on the side of the Puerto Rican community in redistricting, in immigration, in encouraging Puerto Ricans to run for office. I put my money where my mouth is, making substantial contributions. I have badgered the governor's office to the point of insanity on, on appointing uh, Puerto Ricans to political, which he's done most recently with the mm -hmm. clerk of courts here in Orange County. Right, right. He asked me for a list of names to, to recommend. I gave him five Puerto Rican names, uh, and he appointed one of them. Mm -hmm. um, when he's asked for appointments to the board, I serve on the board at Valencia College, for example. Four out of our nine members are Hispanic, two Puerto Ricans, all of them at my recommendation, very strong recommendation. Um, it's my recommendation, for example, at Valencia that we build a campus in Poinciana to serve mainly the Puerto Rican community there because it's difficult for them to get to other campuses. Right, that, that's that very that remote. Um, I put my money where my, my mouth is in professional organizations, in clients, and the like. And I think Americans are decent people. I think Puerto Ricans are especially decent people. One of the ironies is that I have a special admiration for Puerto Ricans because exactly the point I was trying to make is actually a tremendous compliment to the Puerto Rican people. When somebody but it didn't up, come off that way. Uh, granted, so you have to be careful with your are, words. Granted, you have to not not plead guilty. Not uh, you know push out uh, quick emails to reporters, especially. Maria, I'm a reporter for you, a long you, time Maria, here. You, you are, don't do that. Uh, Maria, you just don't do that. Because it's now are. part of the 24-hour cycle. Correct. It is never going to go away. Right. Anybody who Google's your name now, that's going to come up. It's going to be one of the first things that come up. Yes. You for, cannot. For many you are, uh, for many never years. escape it. That's exactly right. It's not like in the old days where you had a, a paper morgue and, and papers right. got all dusty and the clippings and they fell apart and nobody could remember what was written 50 years ago. Sure. That's always going to come up now on your Google I, uh, search. I'm aware of that. And, and the, the, only, the, only comp the only compensation that one has for that is that the people who know me, whether it's my employees or my clients, the people I work with in, in nonprofit organizations or in professional organizations know differently. Um, because, you know, I put my money where my mouth is. And one of the things I'm confident about about Americans, and especially confident about about Puerto Ricans, is that when there is sincerity and when you have proved by your actions, when you, when you walk the walk, when you also talk the talk, when you put your money where your mouth is, um, people tend to give you the benefit of the doubt. And, and but that's it will what take I've done. time. That's why I'm here. I expect to be doing my mea culpas a little bit more. This, will, <laughs> this is not the first and it won't be the last. I appreciate both the kind tone of voice because your criticisms are justified, which is why I apologize, and while I, can, while I will continue to do so. But um, at the end of the day, the point I'd like to make is that every American, Puerto Rican, Anglo, African American, deserves to be judged mostly by the things they do every day of their lives for 25 years, by exactly. the actions they've taken, the work that they've done, the people they've supported, the other things that they have said, and not on one single sentence cranked out in, in, in frustration and stupidity on a busy Monday morning when you're trying to well, operate a business. Uh, That's fair enough. Are we, in, are we in a situation where everybody has now has to be very careful of their language and how the language will be interpreted even though it may be true? I in think, other words, I think Puerto Rico has major problems. There's no question about there's it. There's no They're question about bankrupt. that. They're almost bankrupt. There's no question they about have, that They at have all. major drug problems. They just had it in the front page of the Sentinel where they caught these two Puerto Rican guys who were running guns and, and 13 pounds of cocaine out of a, a colonial to Puerto Rico and back and forth. Those were Puerto Rican guys doing it. So our community does have its issues. But when we are also a very sensitive group where when those, those negatives are brought to you, or brought to the community, they get offended, and I don't get offended by I, those I things. disagree with you on that. I, I don't think that groups are overly sensitive. What I do think, however, is that everybody wants to be respected. Everybody wants to be respected. That's all anybody is asking for. So I, when you speak to people in that tone of voice and you say those disparaging remarks, 
people just sort of stand well, back and say, well, wait a minute, what, what is that all about? I think, we only, we only I think have, that's fair. We only have one minute left, so we got to make it Maria, short. Maria, I think that's a very fair point, and I think that part of that respect in the opposite direction is that when somebody says something in one sentence, if I had inserted the one word that I meant to insert, which was that the only achievable aspiration, because that was my point, is that there's, it's not that people want this, it's because they don't have a choice. They just don't have other opportunities. If I'd inserted that one word, we wouldn't be sitting here. But the other part of respect is you don't completely judge a human being based on four words or one sentence written in 10 seconds when there is a lifetime history of exactly the okay. opposite and respect for that community. We're, we're right. running out of time right now. Um, I would love to explore with you the issue, and it involves journalism and proper journalism, because I believe journalism is dead in America right now. Oh. Okay, literally. I, I, mean, I would not agree it, with that. Okay. But I'll well, have that debate. Every with you, every though. every major <laughs> network has I'm its poli out that. is that has its major political force party behind it. You don't have independent journalism anymore. You don't. Well, that's not on a major anymore. level, network CNN, come on, Fox, come on, okay, mm -hmm. MSNBC, come on. You know, so I, I would love for you to come back next week and we can talk about that. We just run out of time. Um, stay tuned. Uh, we have another interesting situation coming up. I'd like to bring you back next week, okay? I'd be delighted. Okay. Thank you very um, much for the opportunity. And I would like to continue this dialogue particularly. Thank um, you. We're taking a station break. We'll be right back. Before I became a graphic designer, I thought I only needed to master the software. The computer can only do so much. But at Sanford Brown, Ms. McCarthy helped me develop my eye for design. She even shared her own professional experiences. The adventures of a real-life graphic designer. Prepare for your future career as a graphic designer at Sanford Brown College. Call 877-918-6444 now for your Career Builder Career Guide. That's 877-918-6444. On April 26, the Legal Aid Society of the Orange County Bar Association, in association with the American Immigration Lawyers Association, will be hosting Citizenship Day. During this one-day free clinic, legal permanent residents will be able to apply for citizenship with the help of volunteers and as well with the help of immigration attorneys who will review the application. Please call 407-841-8310, extension 3123, for an appointment. I've always had my own style. Yes, she definitely had style. But in fashion merchandising at Sanford Brown, I learned how to make it a career from industry professionals like Miss Cooper, who was really supportive. Textiles, design, marketing, we teach real fashion skills and the business of fashion. I wanted a career in fashion and Sanford Brown helped make it possible. Get started on your future career in fashion at Sanford Brown College. Call 877-751-9111 now for your Career Builder Career Guide. That's 877-751-9111. Good evening. I'm Jose Miranda. This is Hispanic Speak Out. We're talking politics. This evening we have Ms. Hill uh, from District 5, along with our co-anchors, Jason Henry, Glenda Chauncey. Welcome. Thank you for having me, Jose. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here on Hispanic Speak Out TV. So let's get right into it. Uh, you're running for District 5. This is not your first brush with politics, or is it? Yes, this is my first time uh, running as an elected official for City Commissioner District 5 okay. of Orlando. So my question to you is, what's wrong with you? Why, why are you running for politics? <laughs> <laughs> well, I am a community servant. I've been serving in the community and uh, different organizations, nonprofits, for profits. And I saw, and I also grew up in the Paramore area. And I saw there hadn't been much change in that area, nor that district. And working with other organizations, there wasn't much funding. And I had seen uh, $1.2 billion of building in the downtown area. And I saw the people weren't being built. So I decided to uh, bring about effective change if I could become city commissioner. One of the questions I have, because it, it, it always amazes me when people are running for office, is you have a past, obviously, that you've paid your dues for. But at some point, did you know it would come out? I mean, eventually something would come out. So if you're running for office and you know that you have a past, why wouldn't you have addressed that in the beginning of your campaign? Because you know eventually it's going to come out of the wash, right? We know at some point. Well, sure. Before I entered the race, I knew my past. I lived it. So I knew there was right. baggage there. Uh, I do, I, I'm a nurse, 
So I do believe that uh, we should have pure hearts. Unfortunately, I know politics is dirty, but I never thought that I would be defi defined by my past. That's what I believe that because of my past, especially in District 5, where we have welfare moms, where we have uh, drug dealers, where we have the homeless, and I've walked in many of their shoes. So with that, that, that baggage, it made me a strong, it gave me a strong character, made me a stronger individual, and I thought that, and I know I identify with that community, so I was ready for that because my past didn't define me. I'm more suitable because I'm more compassionate because I am those people. I was just kind of surprised because you do have that strength, and I, and I have walked beside you in a project uh, that you and I know about, and it just, it really surprised me when the dirty laundry came out, and I believe it was Daisy at that time that kind of uncovered this information. And I was just kind of surprised because I'm thinking if you're going to run for office, you know at some point that is going to surface. You yeah. know it is. Well, and you use it to your advantage, obviously. Well, well the community wasn't that surprised because I've always <laughs> told the community. I've always right. gone to different forums to empower others. What was surprising was other people outside of the community. Yeah. They didn't know. But at any time, I was always uh, forthcoming about who I was and because I, I, I find it a story of inspiration for those that have fallen, for those that don't have hope, for those that are afraid. There's many of people that sit by us. I don't know, someone in here might be a felon, but afraid, now what I've done, now there's others because I've stood up that they now will decide to be leaders instead of being ashamed and found out and exposed. So I've created an open door for others to uh, actually not be afraid. Okay. Regina, just to shift gears just a little bit, talking about the budgetary issues that are facing the city of Orlando, last week there was an article in the Sentinel that said that there's going to be a large, very large budget hole for Orlando next year. And in his State of the City address, Buddy Dyer said that uh, they're thinking about raising taxes, possibly fees, but they do not want to cut services. What are your thoughts on that, and do you have any alternatives to raising property taxes in the city of Orlando to close that hole? Well, of course, you know, uh, especially in District 5, I don't want to see services cut. Mm -hmm. Um, and with it, and, and with it being such a, a poor economy right now for others, I don't want to see taxes increase. Sure. Now I do think, especially in District Five, uh, uh, let me stay on that, and then. Uh, but I know as a commissioner, I will have to serve all the districts and sure. make decisions for all districts. But there's ten million dollars of CRA money that comes to District Five mm -hmm. yearly. So now, uh, what we have done is giving those resources to venues and, and different other special interest projects. Mm -hmm. Now those monies can be diverted to services that we receive yearly. Mm -hmm. Now on the outside of the city interest, uh, no, I don't want to see services cut throughout the city. Uh, that will be a, a, a decision, a long, hard decision that I will review that I will consult with before I just automatically say we need to raise taxes. Mm -hmm. I don't think that should be a decision made just because the city budget. Maybe the maybe we as the city might have to find something to cut back on versus us putting it on taxpayers. Sure. Now he's alluded that they're going to have workshops this summer. Commissioners are going to attend those workshops. The public is going to have input. Have you identified anything as an alternative? I know you mentioned CRA money that comes into the district, but outside of property taxes to combat the, the budget hole or the deficit, is there anything that you can think of that maybe you would say, you know what, this is something that we can use as a revenue raiser or as a revenue generator instead of raising the property taxes on our citizens? Well, uh, I, I have, and there's grants that I, I think we can get from uh, the nation, sure. international grants, and, and also work with our, our state representatives mm -hmm. to see what monies that we might can bring from Tallahassee to uh, bring back to the city. Okay. So we need to work uh, uh, as, a, as a coalition to save monies or bring monies and resources back to the city. Sure. Well, obviously, in the last few years, and, I, and Daisy Lynam, I think, was 16 years. Is that 16? 16. 16. 16 you know, my question is, you know, it's in disarray. It, it's been going downhill for how long? This, this is not something that just happened overnight. You know, there's been no solutions in the past, and your competitor at this point, who is the son of Daisy, Juan Lynam, you know, 
what are they, why aren't they reflecting back to what was not working? And what are we going to do to make it work? Because the homelessness is getting more. The drugs are getting more. More children are not being fed properly. I mean, let's just call it out what it is. Bottom line is, what is he going to do so different? That, that legacy, as they call it, the line of legacy, what are they going to do so different at this point? Well, originally when my opponent, uh, candidate Juan Lynham, entered the race, he, his platform uh, happened to be continuing the legacy. Mm -hmm. And I do believe, as you stated, that legacy is a legacy of homelessness, of broken promises, of joblessness, of, of, of disparity. Mm -hmm. um, here on May, excuse me, April 9th, uh, because he won only by 37 votes over me, and he decided that he's straying away from the legacy. Mm -hmm. The legacy he don't want to continue because he's right. Uh, uh, that legacy is a legacy that the people aren't accepting. The people won't change. And I'm that change agent. I've been consistent in my platform from day one that we need jobs, that we need adequate housing because housing is deplorable, that uh, we need programs, training and vocational. We need educational programs. Our youth need uh, opportunities and hope. And as you stated, 16 years, the community of District 5 has dwindled and dwindled down. We're building what our commissioner and the legacy invested in. They invested in buildings, and the people have suffered because of it. So um, that's what's going to happen. Someone that truly have compassion for the people, along with working with uh, uh, venues, along with working with special interests to make sure that while buildings are being built, because I have nothing, I'm not against venues. They create jobs, sure. they create opportunities. Uh, matter of fact, I benefited uh, uh, from the first uh, Amway Arena. I was on the Rose of Welfare, I was a welfare mom. Sure. I was on food stamps. And when they built the first Amway Arena, that was my first job. Sure. Now, Regina, I don't mean to cut you off, but I see that we're running a little low on time. Yeah. I want to get one more question in for you. Um, Linda mentioned 16 years where no progress really has been made. I think that District 5 is the most important district in the city of Orlando. I think yeah. that seat is going to be the most important just because of the development that's going on in that district. What are you going to do differently? How, when, when people go to the polls to say, okay, am I going to vote for Regina Hill or Juan Lynham, why should they vote for you? Why should they point to you and say, this is who I want to be my leader for a district that's going to be one of the most important, actually, maybe in Central Florida? Uh, because I'm not going to let the community be left behind. As I stated before, there has been $1.2 billion in the last four and a half, five years that has been... Uh, uh, giving to different venues and, and special interests right there in the downtown area, sure. as you said, in District 5. And what we, we haven't had any minority millionaires come out of that project. Mm -hmm. We haven't had many uh, uh, District 5 and minorities that have been major contractors in that community. Sure. We've had all this outsourced with out-of-state uh, companies. So yes, I just sat with the magic. Um, day before yesterday, and they're building a $200 million uh, sportsplex. We're going to have to cut that short, and I appreciate your time. We're going to have to bring you back to continue that. I apologize. That was a good story. Okay. <laughs> That's, <laughs> I I that. That's there, all right. There's going to be plenty of opportunity there, sure. and I will stand up and advocate for the people, and I won't be a rubber stamp. We will not get the crumbs this time. Okay. We'll sit at the table. We well, appreciate yeah. your effort, and thank you for joining us. Before we leave, uh, leave you for the evening, I want you to know that uh, Hispanic Speak Out TV has uh, now instituted a new blog, and please come and visit us on the, on the website, www.hispanicspeakout.tv, and check us out. I'm Jose Miranda. This is Hispanic Speak Out. See you next week.